So we have Ben Zeitlin with us, uh, speaking to us from New Orleans. We'll be discussing his latest beautiful work, Wendy, um, loosely based on the story of Peter Pan and Wendy by J.M. Barry, uh, very loosely, as, as you who've just seen the film will now know. Um, <laughs> it's an astonishing work. So Ben, thank you so much for being able to, to, talk, to be with us and, and talk about your film. My pleasure. Um, just a little bit of background, actually, I think, because when people see someone's film, they, you know, or films, because Beast of the Southern Wild is, you know, one of the most successful, astonishing, um, independent debut features in a very long time. I mean, it debuted in Sundance, you won the Grand Jury Prize there, it won the Camera Door, Best First Feature Film in can and then it would not put enormous like just award after award or, or honor on recognition as it fully deserved um again set in the american south but you're originally from new york just just fill us in on what that journey was that took you from i get new york city manhattan or, or brooklyn or somewhere like that or williamsburg i don't know exactly where in new york you're from but um to new orleans because it's not the most obvious arc for someone from new york city um, sure. Yeah. Well, I was born in um, Sunnyside, Queens, um, oh, wow. which is, you know, uh, I used to live not, in Queens. Oh, for real. Yeah. Queens is the best. If I, if yeah. I had to be in that place, that's hundred percent where I would be. Um, but, um, you know, I had a really sort of eclectic childhood. My parents are both folklorists and, um, they really studied people who had come to New York and not studied, but like collaborated with celebrated. I was always sort of surrounded by, wildly disparate cultures that had all found their way to New York. Um, and part of what we would do as a family was travel by, you know, we'd take these road trips as a family and go to various sort of American cities that had like really vibrant culture. Um, and for me, I, I came to New Orleans when I was around 12 um, on one of those trips. And from that moment really decided that that was gonna be my place. It just struck me in this way. And from there I sort of discovered um, the music and that found me the, my way to Tom Waits. Tom Waits led me to Jim Jarmusch. Jim Jarmusch led me to independent film. And I had this kind of vision that New Orleans was like just the place where sort of the wild and the free and the- It was you know, your Neverland. Free. You were like 12 years old and decided I'm gonna go to New Orleans and never grow up. Yeah, yeah. I made all my big choices very young. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, and then I found my, you know, um, and then it's, it just continues to be a real, as you can see from the film, just hugely inspiring and kind of has made me the person I am. And, I think you know. in every frame of both Beasts and Wendy, it's just this enormous love for the American South, but also, you know, the, we're moving into the Caribbean here and, you know, that you, you, you extended, you went offshore a little bit, but, the, you know, every frame, every, the, the specificity of the light, I think, permeates through and it's your eye that is in love with that light that you share with us it's very very clear from every frame in your film thanks yeah we have great light here <laughs> it's, big, it's, it's big skies violent weather you know everything is like i don't know there is there's something intangible just about uh the sort of extremes um of just even the natural world um as you mm. in new orleans but then going south into the decay, into the Gulf, and that mm. some somehow that resonated quite a bit with the Caribbean, which experiences like the same storms that hit them hit us. Um, and then in in Montserrat, in this radically different sort of place, whether whether this volcano, but also like just 
being around a volcano, it's the most vibrant uh, sort of natural world. We, to yeah, we, we know. We live on several know, of yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> actually, the, the opening sequences when, when you get to the island in the film, it, it's actually disturbingly close, some of the images, to our own um, active volcano island, White Island, where we recently had a disaster where tourists were caught in a pyroclastic flow, which was heartbreaking and terrible. Um, so the minute I saw that, I started to get personally very edgy mm -hmm. because the um, danger of, of living on top of a volcano is, is present and then it's a metaphor for what lies beneath as well. So I think that aspect of it's going to have a particular resonance for our audiences here in New Zealand. Um, Another thing you, you spoke about, which I also feel strongly about as a connection between us and the film is you, or, or what you were describing about New Orleans and the Caribbean is that the ocean isn't the thing that separates us, but it's the thing that connects us. It's the thing across which we travel to find the, you know, the kindred spirits who share the mm -hmm. same climatic systems. I, I love those ideas. There's so much... Um, there's so many layers to your film. It, it's ripe for different readings and interpretation, which I think all great cinema offers an audience. Um, in many ways, it, it's, you know, it, it could be taken as, as a, you know, a, a story about, about motherhood. I, I, I read it, my, my reading um, is, it's, it's an incredibly profound and beautiful metaphor for uh, our relationship to the planet, um, to the environment, um, the mother being under such threat and being so um, terribly abused in, in the, you know, the, the later sequences of the films. When you were shaping the work, you had an incredibly well-known um, source material. How did you set yourself free from the source to, to, to make it your own fully? Um, you know, I think that it was never the source material that drove, that drove me to make the film, you know, to mm -hmm. me, Peter is like a deity or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, mm -hmm. every, you know, he's so universal, he means different things in different places. Uh, oftentimes, you know, to me, if you ask someone, most people what the story of Peter Pan is, they wouldn't know, they would just know the characters, you know, yeah. it's really unique about that. And, and he just for me was always from when I was a little kid to now, he's like the, he's like the God of youth. He's like this pixie of youth mm. that we all interpret our sense of youth vis-a-vis -vis aging and what that means and what that struggle is. You know, um, it all sort of has always routed through this character of Peter to me. Mm. And so, you know, the framework of the mythology, there were certain things we wanted to use. There were certain things we wanted to completely dismantle, but we wanted to, you know, approach it the way that you know, the way that sort of even like a Bible story is going to be mm -hmm. reinterpreted over and over and over again, um, it, because it helps. It's the way that people understand themselves through myth and through story. Um, and we wanted to treat Peter that way, as opposed to kind of referencing any other cinematic interpretation or even the book in any particular way. It was like, well, let's take Peter, study his essence, what he means, try to understand why it is this character again and again has to be reinterpreted and, and understood in order for us to understand ourselves. And then Wendy herself, who is, uh, again, obviously a, a reimagining, um, giving that, giving the journey to her, giving the narrative fully to her, which, which you know, is, is sort of hers in, in the original work as well, but I think in much more profound way than this. What was what was your decision making around that? And well, Wendy's the one who really uh, who has the great questions to answer. You know, Peter is about certainty. You know, Peter, or at least historically, you know, Peter can't grow up. He has one path. He's got a philosophy, and he follows it, and mm. he cannot change. That is that is fundamental to who Peter is. And Wendy is the one who sort of, um, you know, in the bones of the story, not in the way that it's been told and not in the original text, she's the one that goes and experiences the freedom of Neverland and the joy and the mm. wildness, but then has to go home and has to grow up and has mm. to face life having experienced that pinnacle, you know? And to me, those were the questions that we were really trying to answer, I think, for ourselves personally, that we felt were really important. Um, these universal questions about how to grow up, you know, mm -hmm. and how to do it in a way that uh, 
that, that, that retains that wildness and that freedom and that adventure and that connection to nature, all these things that we tend to be told we have to give up and that we tend to willingly cede to, uh, to aging, you know, and, and Wendy was the one we felt who could kind of, you know, take us through the world of Peter and try to figure out a way out because Peter as free and as great as he is, is trapped, you know, and, right. and, and the, Wendy is looking for a deeper freedom. And that was what we were looking for as artists. And that's what we wanted to really study and, and sort of uh, bring audiences to. And as we can each find ourselves in, in one of the characters, which again is, is a great piece of art. Um, something that, that you created was um, a particular tone and tone I think is always in a film, the hardest thing to define. You can't sort of hire your head of department for tone. It comes out of the writing, it comes out of the directing, it comes out of performance, it comes out of sound, it comes out of camera, it comes out of music, it comes out of production design. It's, it's the tone is, is an accumulation of all of those elements. And as a director, it's managing each of them to create a tone, um, which is, is lyrical and marvelous and threatening and terrifying and delightful. In, in equal measure, um, when you were writing the film, when did you know what that, how that tone would shift? We go, in, we go on a big adventure and then it becomes a very dark adventure, becomes a nightmare at, at, at a certain point. When were you, when were you developing that? Or what's, how long did the script take to develop and when did you arrive at, at that feeling that the film would have? Um, the script really was being written from the point of finishing Beats of the Southern Wild all the way through finishing editing, really, you know, the way that I write, um, and the way that I write in collaboration with my sister were, were constantly adapting the film to the elements that we're finding, mm -hmm. we kind of write a framework for a story, and then we're searching for where that story really exists in the world, right. and that has to do with finding people that sort of speak to these characters, finding a place that really resonates with what we've dreamt up. And so we're constantly taking those elements and then rethinking and revising and trying to really discover and, and follow uh, the adventure of, of writing the film as we go. So it's constantly shifting. And, um, but I think that there was a, you know, in terms of the tone that, that was an early thing. You know, I think that never changed. You know, th there was this idea of this like, you know, explosion of freedom, you know, mm. this sort of frustration uh, of the real world. And, and we were really particular that we didn't want, you know, oftentimes in a fairy tale like this, your hero is in a terrible orphanage or she's got even mm -hmm. step parents, she's in some sort of horrific situation that it's clear why she wants to escape. And we really didn't want to give that to Wendy. We wanted to give her a very good life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of the film is saying, you know, no matter who you are, even if your life is good, you still want to run away. There's still right. this feeling of like, you can't just accept the limitations of your world, even if they're pretty good, you know? And so that was always really important to us. And then this kind of explosion of freedom followed by kind of realizing that freedom comes at, a, at an enormous cost and an enormous risk and an enormous mm. darkness. And that, and that just had to do, I think with my own evolution around kind of Peter, who was my hero as a child, you know, like, the person you want to be, you know, you mm. wait every night hoping he's going to come steal you away. <laughs> and at some point you kind of realize, you know, or I was, as, as we were making the film, as we were starting to get into it, it's like to follow a path of like, I'm just going to have fun every single day of my life. And that is all I'm going to do. Right. At some point there's a real darkness to that. There's a real loneliness. People start to get hurt. There are consequences. And the film was really about navigating that moment and how to emerge from it without your spirit breaking, which is what mm. Wendy's mission becomes. But that's sort of like, we always talked about it, about coming out of the chicken coop. It's like, you're wild and free. And then suddenly you realize you're just in another cage. And on the outskirts of that, you realize that cage is predicated right. upon an incredibly dark world. Part of that shaping of the work, you said you were, you, it was changing as you discovered things. There's some point at which you discovered the landscape of, of the devastated landscape of Montserrat, which is you know, a, a famous um, volcanic explosion that devastated an entire island and community. When did you discover that? Because once we arrive in that, that aspect of the, that, that, that particular location, 
for, that's when for me the the thing lifts into into like absolute fantasy and the, the locations are astonishingly beautiful um when did you find that um er, early on in my travels in montserrat you know i um that whole area of the island is an exclusion zone that you're really not allowed to be oh, in um okay but it's all very real. We didn't we didn't build yeah. anything that is there. Um, yeah. And and uh, I basically linked up with um, this amazing uh, guy who uh, named Mapai and his partner George, who are who who kind of sneak into the exclusion zone to hunt goats and wow. like domesticated animals that have gone feral, and then they herd them back in. And so the only way to get into some of those places was to go with these guys. So we'd go on these like incredible multi day treks across the island. Um, and when I found that, I mean, I didn't find it, when I was brought to Plymouth um, and saw the ruins, I mean, one, it's just the most shocking, breathtaking place you'll ever be. But mm. this whole th thing kind of came into focus for me of like, you know, just the, to have the landscape really shift emotionally, to go from the sort of like vibrant growth of the rainforest and the greens and the ocean and this sort of sense of like bursting life mm. when we're in the world of the youth and then as we sort of suddenly realize that when they're expelled from youth, they enter this stagnancy and decay to sort of find this city mm. frozen in time, covered in ash with no color, you know, that those, those elements were in the story before, but just the emotional sort of like, and the imagery, sort of the, the contrast between the colors and the landscapes and the feeling between those two places, that all just snapped into focus kind of as I walked through it. It was just there waiting for you. It's, <laughs> that's, yeah, it's, 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 it's an, it's an incredible metaphor for so much. And, you know, having, what was it, what was it actually like working out there? It looked really tough. There are times where you kind of think, you know, what were the health and safety measures on this film for these kids? It looked like a bit of a rough ride to shoot sometimes. I mean, it was incredibly arduous to a level that I can't, I mean, like every day of the shoot, was like planning like a invasion but with toddlers and mm. senior citizens you know it just was mm. so hard and 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 but that that to say you know we uh we we had to be incredibly safe you know because the locations were so dangerous um the planning around safety was immense and then the, the lengths we went to to make things look unsafe were also immense you know we really wanted uh, we really wanted the audience to feel that the film was dangerous, you know, um, and, and in, in many ways, these, these places are, people don't go to these places because they're so hard to get to. Mm. Um, that was part of the intent was really to show uh, these, like these islands in a way that you just would never see, you know, even if you went there, you would never see these places. Mm -hmm. People can't get to these places and to mm. be able to shoot a film that was safe for kids and old people in these places was a massive, um, undertaking that hopefully doesn't show, you know, too much because right. we wanted it to feel all very naturalistic, but the, the lengths that we've gone to to be able to safely work on an active, right. you know, were, did it, um, did it make Fox Searchlight a little nervous at times when you, this was the film you proposed to them? Yes, yes, yeah, it did. Um, and, and, you know, but I think that from the beginning, they, you know, Beast, Beast of the Southern Wild was made in a very, very unconventional and very similar mm. ways on a smaller mm. scale. Um, and really when we sort of signed up, you know, way back when, when they acquired beasts, it was always very clear and very sort of like, you know, uh, I, I was always very clear that I was going to continue making films the same way. Right. I wasn't going to compromise right. those, those methods. And, and so, uh, for the shoot, both for that reason, and also because literally there was no way to get to, <laughs> to where we were, you know, right. every person had to be accounted for, right. um, and uh, so there wasn't like a ton of like oversight as we were shooting other than ourselves, you know, who, you know, and we held ourselves to a high standard. Of, of course. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, I mean, to, to, to their credit um, that, you know, that they, they backed your vision and your way of working. Um, I just noticed, by the way, in the credits that a friend of mine worked is yours, clearly a friend of yours, Jonas Capignano. Oh my um, God. Yeah. Who yeah. you know, I've known since um, he was working with the Torino film lab and I was on the advisory board of, of that, um, European institution at the time, but he, you've worked on his film. He works on yours. It, it, do you have a community of 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 people like that 
that you turn to and you know, um, collaborate with is, is it, because I think there's, there's a movement happening, I've noticed, and it was recognized, I think, at the Rotterdam Film Festival this year about the collective undertaking of a film. I'm not suggesting you made this in a collective way, but that collectivity of shared vision, is that something that you lean on as, a, as yeah. part of your process? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and really, you know, we all sort of came up making films together and helping each other on each other's work, even before these films were feature films and recognized, mm. you know, um, me and Jonas went to, to college together. Um, and we, we, you know, there's like a blood oath there. It's like, if he right. calls me and is like, I need you tomorrow, right. I'm going to be there. And that's literally what happened on Wendy. We hit a scheduling problem and I, and a, and a whole sequence on the boat, I needed a second unit director right. and Jonas was in the middle of something else. I called him and he was like, I'll be there tomorrow. And he was dropped everything and came down. And, you know, we, you know, it, it comes from really making films as a family, you know, and, mm -hmm. and we've all sort of, that family had, many of us have like gone on and we're now we're in, directing our own films with our own mm -hmm. communities and methods, but like the sort of, um, you know, there's definitely that, that kinship and that sort of, um, and you, you know, share Sundance art. bloodlines as well, which is, you know, the, a, a nest and a nurturing place for so much independent thinking, let alone the work thinking. Um, so, you know, congratulations to Sundance once again, who are, who are you know, great admirers and, and friends of, of that institution. Um, one thing I really want to hear more about is the creation of the mother. Um, what a beautiful creature, what a beautiful metaphor, what a beautiful cinematic intervention. Um, I just want to hear a little bit more about the mother from you. Yeah. Um, well, the mother uh, is very much like uh, my sister Eliza's baby, like in, in terms oh. of the, even as it was written and certainly in the creation, mm -hmm. she was the production designer in the film and a huge part of her world was the creation of this creature. And, you know, um, just in, the, in the, the making of it, we really wanted to create something real. You know, um, we didn't want the film to lean on the effects and feel, it had to feel very organic. It couldn't be sort of created in a computer. And, you know, the original mother was a full scale underwater human, you know, human operated puppet that people mm. were operating on tanks and, mm. um, you know, and, and then that was then sort of turned into a miniature. But at every stage, you know, the way that the creature interacts with the water, we felt could not be synthesized. And so we, you know, we really spent multiple years developing these underwater puppets of which there was not really a precedent. <laughs> like, I remember at the beginning of it, we looked around and we were like, wow, like no one's ever really done this before, great. And then mm. we found out why. No why? <laughs> it is just about the hardest thing we've ever taken on. And so, you know, um, that's in the, the building of it, sort of the idea of the mother came from there were many many iterations of it but it always sort of came down to like um this uh just this feeling of that one of the one of the, the real things that we lose as we go from being children to adults oftentimes is this connection with our environment and connection with nature which is so uh it's not even a question when you're young you know i think about like mm. when i would go on an adventure and play i would come home and be like covered in bugs and mud and blood my mom would look at me and be like what happened to you? And then I would look down and realize that that stuff was there, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, where, and then, you know, as you become adults, like that becomes disgusting. You create this separation. We start exploiting our environment, exploiting animals mm -hmm. and figuring out how they serve us. And, you know, that loss um, and that shift, I think is one of the, one of the things we really wanted to grapple with in the film. And the mother is sort of the embodiment of, uh, you know, I mean, of, of nature, but also sort of, uh, you know, a, a way for the children to have this visceral sort of communication and connection with uh, how nature feels, you know, which mm. I think that we start to believe is imagination at some point as we grow up, which I don't think is true. Like that is just, it's a real thing that we've taught ourselves to, to not mm -hmm. pay attention to as adults mm -hmm. and we wanted to, to bring that to life for these kids. No, she's a, she's a, a, a glorious creature, both in the, um, you know, the manifestation on film, but also as an idea. So I really thank you for her because, uh, 
all the the trouble you you went to to create her literally i like that we said we discovered why no one had ever done that before it's it very funny i could i could i can see why but it it it's well worth it because it's one of the moments in the film uh where i go oh my god i've never seen this before i've never um i, I i've never had an experience of this kind of otherworldly character and we live in a time where um creation of of mythical impossible non-natural characters are just 10 a penny like every you know every second you know superhero movie has like a slew more of these um yeah. but she arrives in the film and and in the way one accepts her and engages with her in a very different way um so that effort um you know thank you for, thank you for that because she was she was such a gift and and sort of is is quite haunting somehow um, she stays with me. Um, I guess we kind of have to have to wind up. Um, I'm looking over your shoulder that I see a piano, I see a guitar. <laughs> you also um, compose all or a great deal of the of the music for your films. Let he, tell us a little bit more about about that and and how actually if you're playing the music already in your head as a director, how that affects the making of the film as well. Um, yeah, well, I, I co-write all the music with Dan Romer, who's right. a brilliant composer in his own right, uh, and, and really the actual scientist. You know, I, I kind of, the way we collaborate is I sort of, I get these melodies, you know, that in my head and sort of, sort of the bones of themes for different parts and different characters. Um, and then we kind of come together and Dan very much fleshes that out, writes on top of it, you know, helps turn it into a score. Um, but yeah, in, in this film in particular, you know, it was really we sort of had, the, the first thing we had to have, um, there was one song that had to, we had to know before the film, which is pretty unusual because it's sung in the movie. It's, mm. you know, the song that connects the mother to the children that everyone's singing. Absolutely. And so yeah. that dates way, way back. Um, and, and I remember, you know, it's some of the fundamental ideas are the ones that kind of, there's that's one of the ones that's continuous through the whole evolution of the project. And, you know, there was this idea, um, it sort of started from this place of lullaby um, and the way that lullabies are often very similar to sort of sea shanties melodically, it's like these mm. sort of iconic, simple songs that anyone can learn and stick in your head and stay with you forever. Um, and, and we, and we knew that that melody had to kind of connect. There were going to be two lullabies, one from, from Wendy's mother, real mother, and then one from mm. the mother of Neverland. And those two things kind of had to interlock and become the sort of basis for, uh, the score. And so, um, yeah, you know, so early on that that was um, that informed the characters and the tone and, you know, and, and when you sort of, I don't know, I think I think it's a thing when you when you also write music, you know what information is going to be there in the music. And oftentimes, especially like as you work with kids, you know, oftentimes working with non-professional actors, working with children, you can't just sort of lay out the dialogue that you want and it just happens. Mm -hmm. You know, you constantly mm -hmm. have to simplify and adjust and manage what is being said and and knowing what's going to be going to be said in the music allows you to oftentimes subtract mm -hmm. in, in strategic and important you know, ways from um on-screen dialogue because the music can do so much to express you know in this film it's really wendy's interpretation is expressed in the music mm -hmm. you know um whatever she feels whatever she believes is happening uh is what you're hearing and, and it gives her it frees her up to do a lot of other things than just tell you how she's feeling always or even know how she's feeling necessarily yeah the, the score and the, and the sound design is is it's beautiful because it's seamless and then sometimes you want us to notice it and there it's right there and present and then it, it goes back to that that you know that just beneath the surface telling us what as you say with what's going on in wendy's you know in a world and um i i think the, the question of of the song will also resonate a lot with our audiences here because in the pacific region uh, New Zealand Maori traditions, Pacific Island communities, song and and um, song sung together, you know, in in chorus, or is a really really important part of um, of our Pacific cultures. So yeah, we 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 very much looked at um, at that music as we were developing. It was some some of my favorite references were, you know, unison singing yeah. these choral chants yeah. that come, that come yeah. from your region um, and yeah. they're so beautiful and uh, and, and, are, and are so interesting how musically they resonate with, you know, um, 
what's become American folk music that Absolutely. comes from yeah. English and Irish folk. I mean, just that's just like it's a beautiful sort of global thing, and certain things feel like they can be sung across the world, and that's what we were looking for in those songs. And you found it. I mean, I could hear the echoes of some of that in you know in its unique original way that 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 you you, you and your composer created. Um, but in a way, a, a little bit of us was in Neverland with you. So, hey, thank you for that. Um, we do have to wind up. I so appreciate you taking time to share your 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 process and and your energy in the film as well. I mean, it, as you said, it was it was a mammoth undertaking. Um, it's a beautiful, unique work. Um, thank you. And thank you so much for it. And thank you for being with us. Thank you. I so wish I could have come in person. I'm I dying. wish you could. And we will, as soon as these borders open up, we'd love to have you here with your next film or some other special thing. That's fine. You know, that no, there, there would be an invitation here for you anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. <laughs>